I need leave. Hello. I thought of. Hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. <sighs> Let's wait, people. For to sure. come. Okay, we'll wait uh, five minutes for people to connect. We still miss somebody. I think two people. Yeah. Oh, okay. I have to get back to um, mm. yes, let me die you.
Okay. Okay. Maybe we start, uh, and uh, if there are missing people, uh, I mean, maybe we will be able to speak later on if they are going to connect. So, welcome uh, and welcome everybody to this exciting session of the Lego Studies Association Conference 2022, entitled "Corruption and Luxury Seduction in Nigerian Social Life." It's an honor for me how many scholars from different disciplines came to share their contribution at this session, which was inspired by a research project funded by the Research Council of Norway, which I am a member of the LuxCore project. In total, if they will join us, we will have five talks today. And I would like to remind everybody that you have between 10 and even say 15 minutes at this point to speak so that we can leave space to question at the end of all the presentations. So the first speakers, uh, the first speaker I think is not here, so we can go with uh, you, Mili Creton, if you're fine with that. Okay. Um... So let me introduce you. Mili Creton is an anthropologist at the University of British Columbia, where she founded the Center for Japanese Research. Besides tourism, gender, minorities, and constitutional debates, she also researched at Japan department stores and consumer culture, for which she received the Canon Prize. Her recent works has been about Japan's connection with other parts of the world, notably Africa and the Middle East. This involves studying the Japanese living in Lagos and Abuja in the 90s, who worked for the Tanje firm chosen to construct the new capital city, and their interaction with Nigerians. Our intervention today is titled the Japanese employees residing in Nigeria to construct the new capital city, encounters with luxury gift or bribes and expected corruption in everyday life. So I leave the floor to you, Mili. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. And thank you, uh, David, for organizing this session. I'm, I'm just sorry, I have things coming up. Um, I'm going to see if I can share uh, which I can't find it. Um, not that. And if not, I'll just um, talk first. <laughs> Okay, I don't see this coming up, so I'm, I'm just going to talk first. Um, <clears throat> as introduced, I'm uh, an anthropologist and primarily a Japan specialist, but I'm uh, attempting to speak here about uh, issues related to Nigeria based on a project involving Japanese uh, interactions or connections with uh, other places in the world, and in particular uh, at this point with Africa and the Middle East. And I begin in in that research with the case of the, the Japanese employees who resided for a long period of time in, Niger in Nigeria, who were based there as part of uh, the Tange company, Kenzo Tange, or uh, Tange Kenzo, a famous architect uh, from Japan, who was chosen by the Nigerian government to design and construct the new capital city of Abuja. So for the Japanese employees that were sent there, many of them spent several years, um, really starting significantly in the 1980s and 
leading into the 1990s in some cases. To give you sort of a brief background of Tange, uh, he became very famous as an architect in the post-World War II period, involved in uh, many of the peace memorials, uh, the Hiroshima Peace Park Memorial uh, Center, um, but also in, again, related to consumption as, as it was re-emerging uh, and consumerism and the concept of luxury in Japan in many parts of his redesign of the Tokyo area, which had been totally bombed in the World War II. And uh, glamorous new hotels, the Prince Hotels in particular, and other things of this nature. He designed several prefectural uh, important government buildings in Japan. Um, and then began to get contracts elsewhere in the world, including um, an area of Bologna, Italy, where he designed um, an entire district, which is very reminiscent of Tokyo, um, the designs that he did in Tokyo, uh, re-emerging there in that area of uh, Bologna, Italy. So he was chosen by Nigeria to do the design of the new capital city. It was um, an important decision in the sense that it uh, involved, they decided on an, a Japanese architect uh, breaking a kind of protocol of looking for famous architects from Europe and uh, North America, places like New York in particular, um, and therefore this kind of connection of an African and Asian country uh, coming together in that sense. The employees that were sent, as I said, resided there for several years. And um, it, it's an interesting time frame to compare it with now because it was uh, predominantly in the 1980s at a time when uh, Japanese were, were, were getting more and more interested in traveling the world and seeing the world, but not Africa. So uh, this was not sort of a desired place for them. They wanted to go to Europe. They wanted to go to the United States, maybe Canada, Australia, New Zealand, countries such as this. So it was generally all the male employees that were sent, either single men or married men, but not with their families. Wives tended to not want to go uh, to those locations and thought of them as possibly dangerous. And there were no women employees that were being sent, which is not the case now, if you look at uh, those companies sending people to Africa or the Middle East um, as their employees. So there were different things happening in that sense. It was also a time when I think for those Japanese living in Nigeria, uh, there was perhaps a strong sense of culture shock initially, a very different culture that they felt that they were encountering in terms of daily life in Nigeria uh, compared to Japan. And Japan, as they perceived it, a very organized, efficient, rule-based sort of society and all that kinds of things seem to be happening in, in Nigeria as they understood their experience. And many of them had a great deal of difficulty with that. And some of them didn't like it at all. But among those employees, and I'll say that I, I knew many, I knew them in, in the 1980s, I knew of this project as it was going on. Um, there were those who initially felt that way, but as they lived in Nigeria and got into the lifestyle, grew to understand it better and grew to enjoy it. And in some cases felt very disappointed when they went back to Japan and felt that everything kind of went along in a very customized, but also somewhat uh, boring way after their years of living in Nigeria. So part of this is dealing with the idea of uh, their experiences, what with what were corruption or what they felt like was corruption and that in differing ways. Um, and so from their basis coming in, certain things that seemed like uh, clear corruption, and I think are part of the concept of modernity and understood in that way now, but might have in pre-modern forms been more accepted. Uh, prominent among them, the idea of the dash in order to facilitate getting things done, paying, people to sort of help you along, including the government officials who supposedly are not supposed to be involved in that. So it's a kind of taking of bribes. And this was very customary and they all learned that this was involved. So to them, that was a very uh, corrupt process because it would not be expected of official government processes in daily life. And indeed it wasn't supposed to be happening. 
but for example, uh, paying the dash when you come in and out of the borders by slipping money into one's passport to get uh, entry permits to come into the country or get your passport stamped so you can enter. Well, this was expected and, uh, and they kind of learned to do it, but they had sometimes strong feelings towards that. Uh, one of the Japanese employees in a kind of uh, higher position in that he went between the company and the other employees in Nigeria, uh, mentioned that at one time he decided he was going to try to thwart this process of paying the dash. So he spent a great deal of time at the border uh, with the immigration official and had given him his passport. Of course, the, the official cannot say he expects to get paid this money in order to process the passport. And the Japanese employee knew that that's what he's waiting for, but he just acted as if he didn't. And this went on for some time. And eventually the official decided he was going to let him through without paying the dash and did that. Uh, uh, so that after he got through, um, <clears throat> um, he was kind of glad he succeeded in, in this process, even though it took him a long time. And two Japanese employees from another firm um, had actually come to pick him up at the airport. And once he got through, they realized he had not paid the dash to the official. So they ran over to that person and they handed him money. So he felt like he was rather thwarted in his attempt to uh, by his by fellow ja these fellow Japanese in his attempt to sort of try to not pay the dash and facilitate that going on. So those kinds of things struck the employees as sort of clear examples of corruption because they are defined as outside of the realm of of modern rationalized bureaucratic expectations for officials or government employees. Uh, whereas, um, you know, in other categories of occupation, people might pay tips and things and it's not considered a bribe for those types of employees, um, that's not the case. But then there were other cases that involved this issue of the boundaries between gifts and bribes. And this is where things got very interesting and particularly again in looking at the context of Japan in the 1980s um, and Nigeria because gift giving was very customary in Japan. Of course, it's a very big all the time as a gift giving culture. Um, and Japan had risen economically to the peak in the 1980s and it was the so-called bubble economy era. So customary gift giving became very elaborate and very expensive, and it also went to higher ups. Um, so you're giving to people in higher categories. Um, uh, in, in higher categories, and therefore, um, is there something I need to turn off? I didn't quite get that. Um, in higher categories to not necessarily to facilitate what you want done, but often in order to uh, not be one left out of giving these gifts. So they would go to people's superiors at work, they would go to your children's teachers, they would go to other people considered prominent. Um, this was expected, it wasn't considered a bribe, but at some point these were actually getting to be so expensive and so involved in Japan that it began to raise issues and there were cases uh, there were scandalous cases in which people were suggesting, okay, this isn't a, this isn't, these aren't gifts anymore, they're bribes, particularly the Lockheed scandal. Uh, that brought about a kind of uh, re-evaluation of the whole gift giving process in, in the relationship to brides, which continued actually in decades after that. So, uh, so because this kind of was embedded in Japan, there was also the process of bringing luxury goods to government officials as quote, visiting gifts. And again, another uh, Japanese employee to give an example of this, this is someone I knew quite well. And I knew when he um, finished his job in Nigeria and was back in Tokyo in the end of the 1980s. Um, you know, he was often sent by the Japanese firm either from Japan or from their offices in Paris to bring luxury goods to give as gifts when he visited government officials. Um, so 
Uh, so he was doing that. And these would be very expensive items, you know, very expensive watches, Rolex watches, cameras, purses, all of these extremely expensive things. Um, initially, he never thought of this as problematic or corrupt or bribes. They were simply, you know, expected gifts being given uh, to officials by by the company, not by himself per se, but he would be the one transferring them. Um, these were also very desirable at the time, I think within the Nigerian context, because they represented exactly the brand name luxury goods that people aspired to have, um, and therefore were being received in that way. Um, so it wasn't just the expense of them, but what particular they were and what they represented. But um, he did mention he did have at some point concerns over his own personal safety carrying these goods. Uh, there were times because he would be carrying um, several of these and it would be very expensive allotment and therefore he had certain concerns over that. And I guess he was aware of uh, certain people who were robbed and injured in the process. So that, that brought him concern, but not whether these were gifts or bribes. But the... Um, <clears throat> particular incident that really got him thinking about things was that once he was back in Tokyo, um, one of the Nigerian employees came to Tokyo and we all we got together, the three of us, and mentioned that one of these officials that he had known quite well and brought several of these gifts to um, had just been executed uh, in Nigeria, picked up and executed. So this is a real per person and his execution was reported in the English press uh, after that in Japan where we were living. And, um, you know, he took this news very oddly and he was very concerned about the person. And uh, he told me he really hoped nothing happened to him that this would go away and he wouldn't be killed. And I uh, his English was very good, so I knew he should have been able to understand executed as a past tense word. And I said, no, he's he's been executed. And he was quite upset by this and I think grieved because he had visited this person several times and thought he was quite personable. And the person had written poetry and maybe a, I think a children's book. And he began to wonder if this whole process that this person official was embedded in and his government role and the reason he was picked up and charged and the gift giving of these extremely expensive consumption uh, items was all a part of that. And, and that's when he began to sort of struggle with this concept of whether these constituted really bribes or gifts and what all was involved. So I think I'm, do I have time to try to show some images, David, or am I out at this point? I think uh, well, we are still missing people, so you can take. Uh, okay, well, I had some images, but. You should be able to share, yes. There is a button uh, here on Zoom on the right. This does not come up right. when, I, yes. when I hit my share screen. The others come up. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, here it is. Um, I just show. Uh, is the share screen working or has it been? Yes, yes it's working. Okay, so this, do you see? I, I can't get. I got a message that said it was disabled at one point. I don't want to see my. We can see the PowerPoint. Now you are on the first. Page of the PowerPoint. No, no, no. But it's okay. I okay. Um, so, for those of you who are not um, familiar with Tange and his work, as I mentioned, he sort of emerged into prominence uh, after World War II. He was just finishing his architecture work and he was assigned the building of many of these peace memorials. This is the Hiroshima. Sorry, now is no more share it. Uh, you're not seeing it? No. Yes. Yeah. Okay, then I think I'll skip it because it seems to me it should be up. It doesn't come up on this screen for some reason.
Okay, well, I can't get it okay. to come up, so. Okay, now we see your desktop. Well, if it's uh, I can't work. open it fully at the moment. Okay. If it doesn't work, we can. Yeah. Uh, Maybe we go back to that later on. I'm not sure I'm not going to open. Remove. No. Well, maybe we'll go. Okay, I, I can't get it to open and I, I, I might be muted, so. Oh, we can hear you, but maybe we, we will go back to that. Oh, you can move on. on. But um, anyway, I, I, I guess uh, it brings together the nation of the, um, the two different groups and the sort of um, looking at the situation initially it is as if it's totally different from anything they encountered and then kind of wondering about that um, and coming together in different ways as time proceed. Okay, I now can we'll see okay. my... All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would say thank you so much again, uh, since it's not the first time we see uh, for this insight or contribution with served us the interaction with foreign companies in framing Nigerian corruption dilemmas. Uh, so also our next speaker is not here. So we move to, to our next speakers. I don't know if they are all here, but it's a collective contribution. So I would like to introduce uh, Temidayo Akinrola, Akin which lectures in the Department of English Studies, McPherson University of State, Nigeria. Its area of specialization includes forensic discourse studies, pragmatics, and text linguistic. I don't know, uh, Temidayo, if you are alone or, or if there with you, there is also Innocent and uh, Traifu, if they are. Maybe I'll introduce also them. Oh, I'm alone here, so. Okay, but the contribution is by of all the three of you, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, okay. So, um, well, I would also like to introduce in Innocent Aririmako, who teaches in the Department of Linguistic and African Studies, Federal University of Yekiti, Yekiti State, Nigeria. And uh, finally, theoretically, this contribution is also by Ra Raifu Olarewanju Farinde, who lectures in the Department of English and Literary Studies, Federal University, Oyekiti, Yekiti State, Nigeria. And uh, their collective intervention today is that of the Women in Crime, a read of response analysis of Femio, Sophie, and Onchupon for Robbers. So I leave the floor to you. And uh, well, you have. Uh, 15 uh, minutes. I mean, there is time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Femi Osofiso is, uh, is a famous playwright in Nigeria who articulates social, political, and economic challenges of the Nigerian environment. In most of his plays, uh, Osofiso crafts Marxist uh, orientation. He, he, he writes to expose the, uh, the social ills in the Nigerian environment. And he uh, challenges the government in most cases to redress the anomalies in the Nigerian environment. Some uh, most plays by Osofiso present women uh, as individuals who are capable of um, uh, rewriting the Nigerian history. In fact, he gives heroic deeds to women in most of his plays. However, in Once Upon Four Robbers, Osofiso describes women as agents of criminalities. Uh, the play, Once Upon Four Robbers, captures the issue of crime in Nigeria. In the late 70s in Nigeria, 
the federal government discovered that there was alarming rate of crime, mostly perpetrated by the youth in Nigeria. And to nip that on the board, the federal government came up with a, a, a decree to stop criminalities. And surprisingly, instead of that decree, with the decree in place, armed robbery still persisted. So uh, that was what motivated the first officer to write once upon four of us to critique the federal government uh, decree. Or suppose that instead of coming up with a decree that the federal government ought to have addressed the reasons why youths went into crime. So that is what is presented in Once Upon Four Robbers. Uh, studies on the surface have interrogated its place from different perspectives, from the sociological, political, economic, and even the literary perspective. From the literary scene, studies have engaged Osofisan's plays by interrogating the heroic deeds of women. However, in Once Upon Four Robbers, studies have not interrogated women as agents of criminalities. So some of the studies on the Once Upon Four Robbers include those of Ogunle 2004, uh, Akujo 2005, Uwazozo 2009, and a host of others. These studies have categorized Osofison as a playwright that articulates gender issues, gender, political, economic, and historical themes. Studies are yet to engage Osofison's interrogation of women as agents of criminalities and once upon four robbers. This explains why this study examines the play from the reader response theoretical lens. The objectives of this paper are one, to investigate how women navigate crime in the play, and two, to examine what Osofison's portrayal of women as agents of criminalities reveal about his attitude to women and crime. Reader response theory uh, is a theory that makes a place for the reader in the writing process. In other words, reader response theory gives room for a reader mental engagement of text by accommodating the reader's impression. The, the theory submits that the psychological makeup of a text is essentially in describing meaning. This implies that meaning has no independent existence outside the reader's responses. We adopt reader response theory to describe how women's strategic involvement in criminal acts uh, is depicted in this play. So for the method, or sufficient ones upon four robots constitute data for the study. The study adopts the qualitative research design. Essays from the text are used. Uh, the, motivation, the motivation for the choice of the sampled excerpt lies in the engagement of women's role in armed robbery in the text. Character analysis of women in text is done to ascertain their roles in crime. The text, uh, once upon four robbers, presents a group of armed robbers headed by Alani, who is the head of that group. Unfortunately, the war against armed robbery by the federal government led to the death of Alani, the group leader. So Alani, the group leader, is the husband of Alaja. In the Nigerian context, in the Yoruba context, Alaja is a, a religious woman from the, of the Islamic uh, religion. So uh, Alaja becomes the head of that group. The group consists Alaja, Major, Hazan, and uh, uh, we have Hazan, Alaja, Major. There are three now after the death of uh, Alani. So this group engages in criminal, criminal activities. In fact, the, uh, the group seeks power from Anafa. Anafa is, a, is, a, is an Islamic cleric. cleric. Is the Afa is one who prepares charm for them. So Afa's charm helps the group to helps to facilitate the criminalities of the group. So this group attacks the market women. With the help of the medicine, the charm from Afa, they are able to rob market women of their goods. And uh, in the play, we are meant to understand that um, the soldiers who are meant to provide 
uh, safety for the market women also engage in criminal activities. So in the text, we see that corruption plays out in virtually every aspect, every social group in the text. So in the text, uh, Osofison describes women as individuals who perpetuate organized robbery. We have quite a number of uh, SF in the text. For example, Elijah, uh, Elijah says, all, all more than in one single night, major now. So listen, Angola, Hazan and Elijah, listen to me. This is the end. The gun will get to us too in our turn. Or else we quit. Hazan says, but for what? Where do we go? Elijah now says, nowhere. They have trapped us with their guns and decrees. That is Elijah responding to the decree promulgated by the federal government to track the activities of the robbers. So women here are presented as individuals that perpetuate organized robbery. One would expect Elijah, who is a, a respected Islamic uh, worshiper, to demonstrate some measure of um, uh, sanity and uh, good behavior. But sadly, he engages in criminal acts. Also, where women are described as individuals who engage in strategic robbery. From the words of Hazan now, he said, all that is gone. Now we just till they have finished the handling and hustling and are ready to go home with the profit. Then we pounce. Here, Hazan comes out with a strategy with which the group will attack the market women. He tells the group, so wait patiently for the market, market women to round up their, their, their hustle and buzzing so that they can attack. Then Elijah says, a tune and a song, and we rake a fortune. The uh, medicine, the charm provided for them by Alpha, Alpha gives an instruction to these uh, robbers that anytime they are about to strike, that by the time their charm is administered, that she, they should start singing songs. By, by the time the group starts singing songs, the market women will also start singing and will dance to their various homes. And the robbers will have uh, a field day. So that, cap that is captured in the words of Elijah. It's a tune and a song, and we rake a fortune. So this, uh, this uh, tells the reader that uh, the women also devise uh, strategic measures to actualize their goal. Apart from that, women also deploy sexual, they use sexual ploy to engage in harm robbery. Also, officer identifies women deployment of sexual ploy to perpetrate crime in once upon four robbers. The excerpt here, I read this exercise, say, Alhamdulillah, that's Alpha now speaking. Your husband was it? That is Alpha speaking to Elijah. Elijah, yes, I recognize you at the war front when you traded across the lines selling to both sides. It was convenient then, wasn't it? To call yourself a larger, but your pilgrimage, as we all know, was to the officer's brain, not Mecca. Ordinarily, an Elijah is an Islamic uh, woman who has been to Mecca. And uh, so here, Alpha criticizes Elijah for engaging in sexual uh, practices, illicit sexual practices with men. So. Uh, again, women are portrayed as, as perpetrators of illicit market transactions. Let me take this excerpt from one of the women, uh, the market women, say, Mama Alice said, it is all right for you to talk. You stalked the streets drunken and idle and strike at night. But we have, to got, we have got to feed our families, haven't we? Another woman now. We have got to pay the rent, pay the tax. Another woman, Mama, who says, for the taxman has no friend. So this uh, excerpt portrays the uh, illicit market transaction carried out by market women. Some of them uh, inflate the prices of goods and services at the detriment of the consumers. And the reason for this is that the, the reason they, they, they are due is that they are also, they, they, they have to pay their rent, space, tax, and meet uh, some exigencies. So uh, according to them, that uh, prompted them to uh, cheat prospective uh, uh, consumers. So in this um, play, 
or sufficient exposition of crime in once upon four robbers is a testament to his commitment to interrogating inherent social, economic, and political ills of the Nigerian society. This study has investigated or sufficient representation of women in crime with particular reference to once upon four robbers. While a officer dignifies women in some of his plays, he portrays them as agents of criminal acts in Once Upon Four Robbers. He argues that crime is an offshoot of social injustice in the, in the text. A officer argues through the resources of the theater that female characters do not only exhibit dignifying rules, they also perpetuate criminal activities as revealed in the text. The reader is made to visualize how women was in the economic hardship by conniving with price control officers to make life miserable for their prospective uh, customers. Through the resources of reader response uh, theory, the reader is able to engage how women engage in organized robbery. The reader perceives how, woman who's, how womanhood is denigrated through the character of Elijah. One expects Elijah to demonstrate some modicum of modesty considering her religious status. Sadly, the reader is surprised to see her enmeshed in crime against the state. We see how sexual ploys are adopted as a device to negotiate with soldiers. As, that, as if that is not enough, women engage in illicit mechanical transaction to worsen the harrowing economic experiences of the poor. Taking cue from his officer's uh, representation of women in the text, we could infer that he uses the theater to present the other identities of women. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Timidayo. Uh, Thank you so much for this very informative presentation, which also addressed the different aspect of well, crime uh, as well as corruption that are often uh, overlooked when discussing it, such a gender dimension, social injustice, but also the space of the market and its tricky dimension even within literature dramas. So now uh, I would like to introduce uh, our next uh, speaker, Sarah Katz. Sarah Katz received her PhD in history from the University of Michigan in 2019 and is currently a postdoctoral associate at the history department of Duke University. She examines the Nigeria Haji or Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca during the British colonial period and the first two decades of independence. Among her research interests, there are African history, global Islam, visual culture, and Muslim Christian relations. Her intervention today is titled Pilgrimage in Nigeria during the oil boom, Petro Capital, Spiritual Insecurity, and the Figure of the Corrupt Pilgrim. So thank you, and I leave the floor to you, Sarah. All right. Uh... Great, that was a great presentation to follow as there, I think there will be um, some overlap. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so hopefully you can see that there. Okay, um, so first I wanna thank Davide for, for organizing this panel um, and allowing me to be part of the discussion. Uh, so my talk today is less concerned with literal corruption and consumption of luxury goods um, and more interested in the growing public perception that these activities were linked to the Hajj, the Islamic pilgrimage to Mecca um, during Nigeria's oil boom of the 1970s. I'm interested in thinking about kind of why this perception came about, uh, how different Nigerians reacted to it, and how this perception shaped pilgrim behavior. So to start, I want to share a question that kind of struck me early on in my research um, on the history of the Hajj, which was, why Sorry, is sir. it that oh. we should uh, um, you should check your sharing screen because we can see the presentation, but we can see also your script. Oh, I mean, not only the PowerPoint. Oh, probably okay. when you share, you have to select the window of the PowerPoint. Yeah, I thought I had. I, th I share. I selected Microsoft PowerPoint. Is it not Microsoft PowerPoint? No. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. Sorry. Um, so to start, I want to share a kind of question um, that struck me early on in my research um, on the history of the Hajj, um, which was. Why is it that the kind of the first truly national Muslim stereotype uh, that is legible across ethnic, religious, and uh, regional boundaries is the figure of a kind of powerful and sometimes corrupt alaji or pilgrim? 
Within my own research, um, I've found mention of this figure in newspapers and literature um, from the North and South and Southwest, um, as well as uh, in music. Um, so, for example, like a few songs by Fela Kuti uh, that depict Elagis as greedy and you know, with wealth and power. Uh, and even in eastern Nigeria, um, which, as probably many people here know, has a relatively small Muslim population, uh, Misty Bastion has written about how in the 1980s, some Christian Igbos had a stereotypic image of a sort of rich alaji, um, and Igbo businesswomen had taken to wearing what Bastion terms an alaji style. Um, so my initial question here was sort of why is it that kind of what would appear to be the first na national Muslim stereotype? Why is it linked to the Hajj and, you know, not some other aspect of, of Islam? So to answer this question, I think it will help to, for, to give a bit of um, historical background. Um, so my first point in this regard is that uh, in the 1950s and 60s, <clears throat> witnessed uh, sort of the collectivization a bit of Nigerian Muslims. So I, I say I want to qualify it uh, in that certainly um, ethnic, geographic, and sectarian divides remained, um, but it began to be possible to talk about Nigerian Muslims or Islam in Nigeria. And I mean, you, you see sort of for the first time this period, you know, the term um, Nigerian Muslim um, start to come up in, in the press. I argue that this collectivization comes about in part through the nationalization of the Hajj um, because this required a kind of national collaboration. Um, and this takes place in the years that bookended independence um, in 1960. <clears throat> this was a project largely embarked on by Muslim politicians and other elites in the Northern and Western regions. Um, although there were also some Christian politicians as well who got involved for sort of, you know, political reasons. At the same time, um, a new shared aesthetic that sort of blended piety and power got adopted by Muslim politicians in the North and Southwest um, with what I'm kind of referring to as the Mecca uniform, uh, the white robe and black cord um, common to Saudi Arabia. While Nigerian politicians had worn these garments for decades, their consumption, their conspicuous adoption um, by the political elite uh, was novel. Um, so here is kind of maybe the most uh, striking uh, example of this that I've found. This is the front page of the Daily Times the day after Abu Bakr Balewa uh, won the election for prime minister in 1957. And it wasn't just about their sartorial choices. Uh, Muslim politicians explicitly claimed that undertaking the Hajj enabled them to serve the Nigerian nation better. You know, the idea being that kind of when they went to Mecca um, and getting kind of spiritually renewed, that made them a kind of more effective uh, politician. Okay, I'm happy to talk more about that part um, in the Q&A, but uh, for now I want to move on to the next key piece of historical background, which is that kind of at the same time, there is a degree of uncertainty about the future direction of the nation. So similar today, um, and this, the, this graphic here is from data from 2012, but it's you know relatively similar to what it looked like um, in the 1950s. Uh, and you can kind of see that Nigeria's religious demographics were a fairly even split um, between Muslims and Christians. Um, and so there was a kind of degree of questioning of kind of whether an independent Nigeria was going to be more aligned with the Muslim East um, or the Christian West. Within this uncertainty, Christians in the South and the North expressed fears of a potential Muslim takeover of the country. Uh, fears that centered on connections between elite Muslims, the Hajj, and Saudi Arabia. So there are many examples of this, but you know, in the interest of time, I'll just sort of give a few. Um, so one widespread rumor concerned the Islamic Con Congress, an international organization that was founded actually um, during the 1954 Hajj, 
um, by Egypt um, with support from Saudi Arabia. The self-proclaimed uh, ambassador to Nigeria for the Congress was Alaji Dike, a Nigerian from Benin province. Uh, though he drummed up interest in the West and the North, he dramatically quit uh, his post in 1956, claiming that the Congress had been using him to spread, quote, Egyptian communistic propaganda throughout Northern Nigeria. Um, and he, le he alleged that Ahmadou Bello, um, the Northern premier, intended to build a quote unquote Muslim empire with Abul, Abdul Nasser at the helm. Uh, that was not the first nor the last time actually that Ahmadou Bello had faced accusations of conspiring with Nasser um, to transform Nigeria into an Islamic state. During Bello's Hajj in 1954, he visited Egypt and invited Nasser to Nigeria. In the Lagosian uh, press, this stoked concerns that Bello held greater allegiance to Islam than to the, the state of Nigeria. One editorial in the Daily Times mused on the difficulty of knowing, quote, where the private pilgrim ends and the premier begins. And it wasn't just Yoruba Christians um, in the Southwest that were a bit concerned. So in 1958, the president, the president of the Geoman Youth Movement in Jos expressed concern over, quote, strong rumors that non-Muslims in the North would be sent to do menial jobs in Saudi Arabia after Nigeria had attained independence, unquote. Um, so there's more I could say here, but I, I hope this historical background kind of helps everyone understand why I want to argue that this sort of figure of the corrupt pilgrim stereotype builds on this longer history of skepticism and distrust of connections between Muslim Nigerians and the Middle East, notably a distrust begun by the British colonial state, and that's kind of a, an earlier um, chapter of my of my research. And the collectivization of Nigerian Muslims helps explain why the behavior of a small percentage of Nigerian Muslims became a national concern. You know, in my research, I have found debate, uh, debates over pilgrim behavior going back until the 1920s, but these debates were always kind of more local, localized. You know, they would be, you know, Muslims in Ibadan, you know, having a debate, but not you know, on a kind of national scale. It's only after independence that they become national. Okay, so now I'm going to turn to discussing the emergence of the national stereotype of the corrupt Alaji, um, which began in the late 1960s and was well established by the 1970s. So notably, this was a, a time when the number of pilgrims skyrocketed thanks to lower airline prices and wealth um, generated from Nigeria's oil boom. Um, so you can see here the, the kind of the rate of, of, of oil really goes up um, sort of, I guess that's like between 1973, um, 1980. And now you can see here the kind of how the um, number of pilgrims kind of you know, roughly follows that. Um, so if you look at this graph, you'll notice that within a decade, annual pilgrim numbers jumped from 4,000 in 1964 to 70,000 in 1974. So it's, it's quite um, a dramatic rise. At the same time, there is a growing sense of the Hajj becoming commercialized. Um, so here's one ad for a shoe style that the Bata brand dubbed the Hajj or Holy Shoe uh, in 1977. So it's within this context that the stereotype of the corrupt Alaji emerges and spreads. Um, I first found it surfaced in the press in 1965 when an editorial lamented that those who, quote, hide under the deceptive cloak of pilgrimage uh, to commit crimes were, quote, tarnishing the good name of this nation and Islam. So the event that sparked this complaint was that Saudi Arabia had arrested uh, 22 Nigerians for smuggling on arrival in the Jeddah airport. The main items confiscated by Saudi customs officials were kola nuts, currency, and pharmaceutical drugs, 
outlawed by Saudi Arabia. If pilgrims occasionally had smuggled before the 1970s, um, what changes in this, the, this decade uh, was the scale and sort of the discourse surrounding it. There were annual government notices, sort of warning cust of customs officials, strict measures against smugglers. And these official warnings had sort of clearly damaged um, Pilgrim's reputation. In 1973, one Muslim op-ed writer from Ibadan claimed that the majority of Pilgrims went to Mecca to trade or smuggle, and an Islamic news column decried the quote-unquote smuggler Alaji. Commenting on the Mecca uniform, one cleric argued in their column that to be an Alaji required, quote, much more than mere dressing, um, and that in kind of engaging in such activities negated the spiritual value of their Hajj. A regular Muslim citizen made a similar argument in a letter to the editor. Christians also weighed in, um, with one in 1974 remarking that the Alaji title meant, quote, there goes a smuggler. There was also a kind of emergence of a new convention of news reporting kind of that amplified these critiques. So as you can kind of see here, in the 1970s, headlines concerning anonymous Alajis committing crime became commonplace within the Western regional press. Though this genre of headlines existed um, by the 1960s, it, it rarely appeared. But by the 1970s, even an occasional reader of the regional dailies would be greeted with headlines like psychedelic Alaji weeps to jail. Uh, popular culture, um, such as sort of music um, and literature, uh, also kind of amplified the figure of the corrupt pilgrim. At the same time, uh, critical voices against the Mecca uniform emerged in the press. Several commenters, uh, both clerics and ordinary Muslims, framed wearing the Mecca uniform as separate, if not opposite, from pious behavior. In 1973, uh, the president of the Muslim Association of Nigeria bemoaned that, quote, we have become Alajis and Alajas whose faith is measured by the amount of gold we can smuggle during pilgrimage and how many Makawiya and Aga Sharif are on display in our show glass cases in our house. At the same time, Nigerian politicians stopped carrying out official duties while dressed in the, the Mecca uniform. As that last point hints at, um, the other pilgrim behavior that came under fire during the 1970s was consumerism, um, particularly consumerism of luxury goods. Critics of the pilgrimage uh, complained that because pilgrims took Naira out of the country, it was a drain on the national economy. Um, for example, one person claimed uh, in 1973 that the Hajj resulted in, a, in at least 12 million Naira leaving the country. And, you know, while he agreed that the Hajj was fine for the pious, he alleged that most of this currency drain was done, quote, under the guise of religious worship. Other critics claimed that pilgrims abused their traveling allowance by purchasing luxury items, you know, like TVs and other electronics, uh, and treating their Hajj as a quote unquote shopping spree. What I find interesting here, you know, is that kind of by the 1970s, um, you know, the corrupt, uh, Pilgrim is well ingrained in Nigerian society as kind of the first truly national anti-Muslim stereotype, um, and it emerges through debate involving Muslims and Christians uh, across Nigeria. Government officials, traditional authorities, uh, clerics, musicians, and novelists all addressed and played with this stereotype. For the, music, for the musician, Fela Kuti, you know, the figure of the greedy Alaji provided fodder for his sort of larger case against Islam and Christianity as religions that had cannibalized African culture. Whereas for politicians and clerics, it helped justify placing further restrictions on the Hajj. So actually in response to a record-breaking year of 100,000 pilgrims, 
the government capped the pilgrimage at half of that the following year in 1978, and Quran tests um, were were used um, to kind of weed out unworthy pilgrims. Finally, I, I'm interested in kind of how this stereotype impacted the experience of Hajj for Nigerians. Um, so to give one example, um, one Muslim woman in Ibadan recalled to me her initial unease um, with her new public identity as an Elijah in 1983. Not only did her fear of being labeled an opportunist cause her to not buy the Mecca uniform, um, but at first she even forbid others to call her Alaja. Um, and it was only when a colleague encouraged her to adopt the title so that she could model proper uh, pilgrim comportment that she consented. However, she refused to celebrate her completion of the Hajj, a fact that had really upset her mother, um, who herself had completed the Hajj in the 1960s. So here you see a kind of generational uh, shift. Okay, so to conclude, uh, I want to suggest that, you know, what I see is the potential significance of this history. For many Nigerian Muslims, the end of empire was sort of not only an opportunity to improve the Hajj, but also build ties with Arab countries, um, such as Egypt and Saudi Arabia, which had previously been curtailed by Britain. Christians, for their part, continued to associate the Hajj um, with a risk of ideological contagion, much like the British had done. Added to these anxieties inherited um, from the colonial state were those sparked by the fact that because decolonization roughly coincided um, with the growth of Saudi Arabia's oil wealth, um, by the 1970s, Nigeria was the beneficiary of various forms of Saudi soft power initiatives like mosque building and study abroad scholarships. Um, and so while I certainly think that the roots of present Muslim Christian te tensions in Nigeria can be traced to colonial policies more broadly, um, you know, I think partic particularly the fact that, you know, the North and the South were administrated um, separately for, for much of the time. Um, I think that sort of these broader global histories of the Hajj have also contributed um, to religious tensions. Um, although, you know, this is an argument I'm, I'm still um, developing a bit, so I'm open to any feedback people may have. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. This was a great way to, I think, close the interventions today. Although today contributions uh, departed from the view the corruption is all about state bureaucracy. We are talking about uh, consumerism, foreign companies, uh, market, gender, and economic transformation that oil has brought to Nigeria, even to the idea of to collective moralities, let's say. Nigerian national resources, I think, are behind new desire for wealth, hopes, and dilemmas also were represented in Nigerian public scene demonstrating that corruption is much more complicated than an assumed the weakness of the state as the Western media often describe it, or at least as the Western media started to describe it after the 90s. Uh, oh, yes, Mili, I think you can uh, came back with your uh, screen on now. And uh, anyway, I think it's time to open the floor to to questions from the audience, as well as questions from uh, the speakers, between the speakers, if they are some. Uh, I think somebody disabled the video of Millie. So if you can enable that. I can ask, uh, my, uh, I can ask a question briefly. Yes, yes, um, sure. To, to Millie. Um, I guess I, I was wondering, so, you know, one thing that I was thinking about kind of uh, while you were giving your talk is sort of the, 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 the context of the 1980s in Nigeria as this time of oil bust and sort of austerity, government cost cutting. So, you know, for a lot of these sort of government officials that are maybe asking for a dash, you know, it's quite likely that they haven't been paid their salaries, uh, you know, for yes. months. And so I was yeah. wondering you know, how, how much were, um, you know, these Japanese architects and, and, and whatnot, how much were they kind of aware of the broader kind of 
uh, you know, political economy at the time? Um, and how did that kind of inf impact how they kind of experienced the, the dash, I guess? Um, well, I think when they arrived, they were not, uh, they were, some of them were architects or part of the design crew. Uh, and then there's a large number of just employees and they're mostly a lot of people working on construction and other things. I think many of them arrived without much understanding of Nigeria or Africa at all. And, 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 uh, and as I alluded to, there were sort of lots of um, preconceptions and I think stereotypes within Japan at that time that I don't think necessarily exist now related to Africa. Um, so I don't think they understood that. And I think from their point of view, this was a clear example of something that should not be happening. Although, you know, in my conversations with some people, you know, we could talk about yeah, well, you know, if you have other kinds of jobs, it's not unreasonable to expect uh, that, you know, you get like tips, right? And maybe this is how this is conceptualized, you know, if you, you, you can get this extra payment. So I don't think they would have been aware of that. I think they were aware of lots of other, you know, I think they quickly became aware that, you know, the employees at the entry lines um, were that there was a lot of corruption surrounding sort of the whole government um, and all of these activities. Uh, the example I gave of this, um, the government official who was executed, and I, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know that he was any more corrupt than anyone. I think he probably was picked up as a, a person to be accused and um, put through, although. He, uh, was really significant, and in particular, this employee, Japanese employee that had interacted with him and bringing all those questions to his mind and to the fore. But I, I would add that I very much appreciated your presentation in kind of setting, you know, also the stage for this, because you're alluding to the extreme growth, like starting uh, in the 1970s and the whole oil boom and all of that, which I think led into this uh, as I understand, a big desire on the part of Nigeria to position itself um, differently on the world stage and build this new uh, capital city as kind of the ideal modern capital city and come up with this, what they felt is this, you know, famous international architect. Um, but I also think it's very interesting that they picked somebody, that they they didn't pick somebody who was like European or, you know, the that would have been the ideal at Time and created this other context in the same way they seem to be trying to expand and make the kind of connections with other places that you alluded to. So. Can I ask you one thing, Millie? Uh, people in Japan were never accused or persecuted for corruption in Africa or not, I mean. There were ever accusation in Japan about Japanese corrupting people in Africa, or they were somehow. Uh, I, well, I never heard of that, that they were corrupting people in Africa. You mean the Japanese corrupting people in Africa? Yes, and uh, in, ja in Japan, nobody accused them of this. I mean, there was no discussion in Japan about this. Within Africa or about, within Japan? About what was happening in Africa. Because you know, I mean, right. if you try to do something like that in the theoretically, I mean, you can be persecuted, for example, in the if United you, States. If you try, if to, you do try to corrupt people uh, in Africa, theoretically, you can be persecuted in, United, in the United States itself, not just in Africa. I mean, it's something okay. that theoretically you should not do having a company there. So you can be accused well, even in your own country, at, at least theoretically. Then I, I've, that yeah, was... I've never gotten any sense that there were any Japanese involved in corrupting Africans, unless you consider this idea of bringing these luxury goods, which it 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 wasn't considered at the time. I mean, I mean and I think it was not within Japan that wouldn't have been considered because this would have been the kind of thing that people would have expected to go between companies doing these deals. There was uh, the dimension of the Lockheed scandal. That was when, um, I guess, it was sort of the Japanese 
companies vying to get the air routes open certain places, it involved huge amounts of money. And, you know, it still was being presented as, oh, these customary gifts. And people were saying, no, this is, this is too far. This and that started kind of this whole evaluation procedure. Uh, but I don't think there was any um, thought within Japan, um, either at the levels they were involved in, that there was any kind of corruption. And I've never heard or, or any kind of sense of the Japanese corrupting um, Africans. Mostly they were there working and, you know, doing the assigned contract of building uh, of building this capital city. When it came to the Japanese populace, um, I don't think they were interested in Africa enough at that time, okay, which is very different than now because now, of course, Japanese, and we're talking about a different generation of Japanese who are extremely interested in Africa and going to Africa. I mean, at that time, they didn't want to go to Africa. They, they wouldn't have been interested if you brought up Africa. I think people wouldn't have, you know, been interested in it in the way they were with other parts of the world that they would you know, just immensely be interested in and pursuing. So I don't think there was, was a kind of discussion of that nature at all in the sort of general sense of Japan. Okay, thank you. But you think, you was there doing your field work, you think other Nigerian felt that what they were doing was actually bribing them or just something so customary? Because I mean, you can see the same kind of, uh, of uh, ambiguity when you look, for example, to, to Pentecostalism after the oil period, after the prosperity gospel. I mean, yes. there are accusations of uh, corruption against the Pentecostal pastors by people. Uh -huh. At the same time, oh, uh, not all yes. the type of consumption uh, are automatically understood as corruption, but still there are people that can see that there is some kind of line. Um, okay, I I was I knew these people and I knew them when they came to Japan. I was living in Japan. I knew the Japanese that came back and then lived in Japan. I knew them while they some of them while they were there, either in the Lagos or Abuja, and I knew. The Nigerians who went back and forth to Tokyo and their experiences, uh, which I didn't talk about, like the Nigerian experiences going to the, the Tange company in Tokyo. And they were uh, they were rifled with prejudices, not from the type of people that went to do the work, but more like the office staff that you know, were at lower levels, things of this nature when they came. Um, but I wasn't in Lagos, so I, you know, the gift giving went to these, you know, they're, they're fairly high individuals. And um, I think probably by that point, they might have been quite used to getting, you know, these kinds of gifts all the time uh, as part of their life and, you know, their role and not just from Japanese but from others and other foreign countries, maybe by other Nigerian interests that are trying to get something done. So they, they I mean, I can't say how they would perceive it, but I think they took it as kind of almost a given that they would be getting these kinds of things and, uh, uh, and therefore not unusual to getting it from the, the Japanese companies. And I think they were probably getting it from us. Whether any of them recognized it as potentially some kind of corruption, you know, in their receipt of it or not, I, I have no idea, but I, I'm sure they were used to it kind of thing. Kind of like getting wined and dined as part of negotiations that we experience all the time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Milly. And uh, okay, maybe there is a question for Temidayo. Temidayo, if you are there, there is a question for you in the chat. Okay, sir. So if you want, I can read it. I wondered if Temidayo could speak to or draw connection between uh, also fees on representation of women in crime and contemporary representation of same in Hollywood, which is a kind of interesting question. I guess corruption is a lot also in Hollywood, in Hollywood films. In Hollywood films. 
Oh, please, can you take that question again? So I wondered if Temida, you could speak to or draw connections between Osorifan representation of women and crime and contemporary representation of same in Hollywood. Yeah, yes, the officers represent of crime, like I said in Once Upon Four Robbers, uh, in that text, Osorifan depicts women as agents of criminalities. And I think um, on that note, one could even uh, uh, depict Osorifan as uh, a prophet of his time for because uh, the text, <coughs> Once, uh, Once Upon Four Robbers was written uh, in the 70s, in 1976. And, um, uh, most, uh, he projects into the future, the contemporary world in Nigeria now, especially the Nigerian Hollywood uh, films, where women are represented as uh, uh, agents of sexual crime, sexual criminalities in most of these uh, Hollywood films. Women are projected as uh, sexual, uh, in fact, most of these Hollywood films objectifies women as individuals who perpetuate uh, sexual crime. And uh, that is where we could draw the connection between uh, Osorifan's depiction of women and crime in Once Upon Four Robbers and the contemporary Nollywood uh, uh, theme, the representation of women in the contemporary Nollywood uh, themes. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, Temidayo. So from the 17th, still anyways, after the 17th, all of this started, I think maybe this must make us reflect. So I don't know if there are any other questions from the audience or as well from our speakers. Um, I, I was wondering if I could ask, this is kind of off the wall, but Tommy Tayo, if he, if he has any thoughts about the American television show with, with Abishola and all of that group of, of Nigerian women that are the predominant, I don't know if you're aware of it, but it's the Bob Hart Abishola in which it is um, most of the, the, the prominent characters are all women, the Nigerian characters. It's the only show I'm aware of uh, that features this idea of Nigerian characters. Um, they are not corrupt, they're not involved in crime, and if anything, they're absolutely reversed. They are sort of the honest uh, uh, women of Nigeria kind of portrayal. Um, almost no men. I mean, there is the husband uh, of one of the women, but otherwise it, they're all women who you see at work or women in family roles. Um, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on it or that it, it's coming to prominence at this particular time in which you, this show um, featuring uh, in particular Abi Shola as this female woman, Nigerian woman character, and then all of her co-workers and family members as, as female Nigerian characters. Oh, I, I didn't get that. Okay. You, you might not even know the show, but there is this uh, current television show that features this Nigerian woman and a lot of Nigerian women on it that um, I think is, is interesting just in the way it, it has become popular or the the overall you know North American population to have some Nigerians and particularly Nigerian women. I think. Can you write me the name of the show in the chat? Oh sure. Thank you. And it's strange. So the name of the show, Bob Hart's Abby Shola, woman from Nigeria. Um, 
And in the case of the show, it's people like her Nigerian husband that caused the problems when he comes over and this kind of thing. So it's in some ways a kind of reversal of what you're discussing. Whereas in Nigeria, it seems like the films you're talking about, there's a controlling element on women by suggesting them as involved in this kind of sexualized crime element. Yeah, I'm reading about it now, but yeah, I mean, uh, I'm not surprised. I mean, in Hollywood, you can find, I guess, everything and the opposite of everything. <laughs> and in this case, it's uh, not even just Hollywood. This is an American sitcom. So there are Nigerians in the production, but I see also American people. Yes, but it, it features the cast of uh, yes. several which is a yes absolutely um i think that's uh, you know has never happened i mean i've never seen a sitcom focused around um, a particular nigerian woman or a group of nigerians so they've been sort of not part of that you know, public uh, consumer realm until now so now you you have that right all right America or in the Hollywood or in the movie industry, TV industry. So. Okay, you're right. So uh, if there if there are no other questions from the audience, I think no. I would like to thank all of the speakers today, Sarah. Thank you so much, and it uh, was nice to meet you for the first time, mainly again, <laughs> and uh, Temidayo. And uh, well, as much as I hope to see you soon in real life, maybe in Nigeria, maybe in Lagos, where I currently am, I hope you have a nice prosecution with all of the other sessions of this uh, great conference today. And they thanks also the audience for being with us and for listening to us. So thank you very much to everybody and uh, see you soon. Bye-bye, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.